We start off with the first speaker who has much more interesting things to say than I do. Actually, he doesn't really need some big introduction. I mean, we all know his name, Alan Lowry. He is the author of three very good books on coniferous plants of Australia. Most of us have seen them, read them. He did, he did a lot of scientific work on new species. Um, he was also a very nice guy who had dragged a lot of people all over Australia, <laughs> showing them more plants than they could possibly imagine. So I was one of them, of those lucky people. So I still thank him very much for what he showed me. And he's going to show us a lot of things now with his first lecture. He's kind enough to do two of them. And his first lecture is about Australian sundews. So please welcome Alan Lowry. Thank you, Marcel. What a great location, people. Welcome, and may you enjoy the next few days. My world is Australia. It's approximately five hours to fly from the west coast to the east coast. It takes about four hours from the southern portions to the northernmost part up near New Guinea. It is huge. In all the work that I've done in this area, I've barely scratched the surface botanically. I think it's going to take a long, long time before we know the flora of our country. The interesting thing about Australia is the southwest corner of Australia, or southwest Western Australia as we like to refer it to, is probably one of the most botanically rich areas for flora. We have, at last count, we haven't got an exact count, but we think there's somewhere between 15,000 plus species that occur in the southwest portion, from about Esperance there to Kelberry in the northern part. It's a small area on world standards, but it's got species like you wouldn't believe. The diversification of Drosera is unbelievable. And in many cases, most of the plants are endemic to that part of Australia. We start off with Tasmania, where there's snow, you can go skiing, it's cold. Here I am just below Mount Wellington in Hobart. And in this area, we have Drosera arcteri. It spends its dormancy under snow. I have to take about 15 shots out of here because the file was too big, so it's a little bit mixed up. I'll see where I'm at. Here's a typical Drosera arcteri from Tasmania. And here we can see a new species which is related to Drosera arcteri. It has these beautiful cerise stigmas whereas the type for Arcteri has small white ones. It has a large flower and it has different foliage as well. So there's actually two Drosser Arcteris in Tasmania. This one we discovered on the Hartz Mountain Range. It's got these beautiful cerise, large cerise stigmas, grows up in the alpine meadows, is covered with snow in its dormancy period, and when you put it up against the type, this is the type for Drosser arcteri, here is the new species. You can see that they're quite different. Also, the leaves or the life form of the new species has smooth leaves down the bottom, lots of and large, whereas the type has virtually none. And it always seems to have one large leaf sticking up like one arm. Help, I'm drowning. And that does most of the work. At best, you might get another one with two. On very rare situations, you'll get three. But one is common with a flower spike. So one to three leaves only. For dormancy, it fades back to its root sections and is covered with snow and spends its dormancy so. 
Then we go to the opposite. We go from the cold of Tasmania to the regions of Cairns in tropical far north Queensland. And here we've got three endemic species. This one here is Drosser Adelaide. You can see here a nice, this is a new discovery at a new location with a nice flower form. Normally they're red or white, but this one's got a little bit of red striping on the white flower. This is Drosser Adelaide. We ha also have Drosser prolifer, prolifera that only grows on one mountain. Mount, and then in, on Mount Bartlefria we have another one, Shizandra. So there's only three. And of the three, they all look the same in the seedling stage. Once they get into the adult stage, they're totally different to each other. Where are we at now? Spatulata, of course, is very, very common along the east coast of Australia, from Tasmania right up to the tip of Cape York Peninsula. It occurs in Victoria and New South Wales and gets a little bit into South Australia, but it's not in my state of Western Australia. The utricular area is a bifeeder growing with spatulata. Bermani is a common species from the Kimberley in the west coast of Western Australia, across the entire northern regions of Australia, and coming all the way down to about Sydney on the east coast. A species that looks in the plant department like a Bermani is Glandoligera, which is found to be very common in Western Australia, but it does occur in South Australia and a little bit into Victoria. But it has these beautiful metallic flowers, unmistakable. And in the same shot, we've got, when you get a nice clear shot of this up on your computers, because I'll have discs of these to actually give you people so you can study these photos in detail. But in this shot, and I will explain at the top here, that there's actually a pygmy drosera, drosera leucostigma, and there's also a tuberous drosera, drosera menziesii. Then we have this strange one in southwest Western Australia, drosera hamiltonii, where it's a perennial. Uh, it can, in drought, lose its leaves go deciduous and revert to the black thickened stems for dormancy. The interesting thing about the history of this thing in our collections is a good friend of mine, Steve Rose, probably 40 years ago, sent a specimen of Cephalotus to S Mr. Snell, and in that specimen clump was one plant of Hamiltonii. And that one Hamiltonii, because it's so easy to grow, is probably in 99% of the collections across the world. So we've all got the same clone everywhere. I think it would be a good idea to actually get some new material into the collections and mix them up a bit because there's one mono clone out there and that is not safe. Nice friendly kangaroo in an area called Cape Arid, which is east of Esperance. There's actually a joey, which is a baby kangaroo in its pouch, and it's saying, hi, Alan. The photograph up here is the shot looking back this way to the ocean. So you can see this rock outcrop, it's a granite outcrop, is very, very close to the ocean. Growing on there, we've got Drosera ramulosa, and we've got Drosera menziesii subspecies penicillaris. There was also Drosera glandoligera on the same rock. This kangaroo was one of probably 50 that were there, and it seemed that their grazing does not interfere with our beloved plants, carnivorous plants. They leave them alone. They don't chomp on them. In Western Australia, we have winter wet swampland. And the best way to describe that is in Western Australia, we have a Mediterranean climate. We have the four seasons in name only. We have a long, dry summer, cloudless, with very little rain unless a thunderstorm comes through, but everything is bone dry, it's extremely hot. Then it starts to 
cool down, which we call the autumn. Then we get a heavy dew in the morning and a little bit of rain. Then we get into winter, but it's not winter, winter, that is raining every day, cats and dogs dropping from the sky. It's patchy, a little bit of rain here, a little bit of rain there. You can actually be here where it's raining, go over there where it's not raining, later on pick up the rain over there. You can actually see the rain dropping in your part of the world in patchy areas. And when it rains, it lasts for half a minute, thereabouts. But it's enough to wet the soils. These winter wet swamplands, you need rubber boots to work, walk through them when they're active. This is the time all the carnivorous plants are doing the things, doing their, their growing. In the summertime, you could strike the ground with a rock hammer and sparks would fly off it. It turns into a hard brick-like consistency. In the wet season, like this, if you drove through in your car, you would sink up to the door handles. It's yin and yang, sloppy wet and hard packed dry. The smallest tuberous stross we've got is Bulbagina. The whole thing can be, a mature plant can be about one and a half centimetres tall, on average about two and a half centimetres tall, with a flower on it probably 10 mil across. And the tuber on this species is roughly a match head or less. It asexually reproduces, that is the parent tuber shoots up the new plant. If the conditions are good, it will send out additional tuber producing stolons below the soil off the main stem and produce one or two additional tubers. So it will replicate itself asexually quite easily if the conditions are to its liking. Then we move to the biggest erect. In tuberous drosseras, we have rosetted ones, flat to the ground. We have erect ones, they're self-supporting. We have climbing ones that need nearby bushes and shrubs for support. Going from Bulbagina being the smallest tuberous drossera, Drossera gigantea is the largest erect tuberous drossera but it's not the longest or tallest. In the climbing division, that record is taken by Erythrogyne, which is a south coast species, and I've had specimens in the field measured them up to nearly three metres long. They just keep on growing. And the tubers, believe it or not, even though the plant is three, minute, three metres long, are only about 12 millimetres in diameter. Tiny little tuber. Here we've got Drosera menziesii, subspecies Bassifolia, growing in cultivation. And this one is one of the many menziesii. We have, I believe, a number of species in the group. We have a Drosera menziesii. The subspecies Penicillaris is good enough to stand up on its own as a species, Drosera penicillaris. We've got uh, Thrysanocepella, that can stand up on its own. Bassifolia can stand up on its own. So we've got, and there's also an orange flowered erect, short erect menziesii, which can stand up on its own. So just the section of Drosera menziesii, with some good work, will be broken up into five good species. And the same can be said for the Drosera erythoriza complex, the Drosera gigantea complex, where we have a subspecies geniculata. In my opinion, there's two species there. So the numbers of what we've got at the moment are going to change as more work and study is done on the group. And especially today, when we've got sharp tools to work with, DNA sequencing, chromosome counts and so on, these will tip these species that are on the edge at the moment over into the species division. No problem, no argument. Of the tuberous drosseras, most of the flowers are just plain white or pink or variations of pink. 
This is one I named Drosera bicolor for obvious reasons. It's the only tuberous Drosera that supports two colours on its floral parts. This same red spots, etc., is quite common in pygmy Drosera's. Then we move over to the microphylla complex. And in the microphylla complex, we have Drosera microphylla. We have this beastie here, which is currently known as variety Macropetala, but it's good enough to be a species in its own right. We also have a white-flowered one, which is also a good species. And I have a paper at the moment with Dr John Conran where we're pulling these apart. But at the moment, its name is Drosera microphylla, variety Macropetala. One of the beautiful things about the microphylla group is the flowers last more than one day. They close at night, they open in the day, and they'll do that until they're well and truly pollinated. And so they can not mess up their pollen store, the petals are actually curved. And when they come and close, they close like a light bulb and protect the pollen from being washed out by dew or rain or anything like that. But these will open and close over a week until they're well and truly pollinated and then they'll fade. Who we got here? Then we get into the Drosera erythoriza complex. At currently at the moment we have Drosera erythoriza, erythoriza. We have a, its big uh, re relative, Drosera subspecies Magna. We have a subspecies Kalina. We have a variety Imbacilla and, every, and another one, Squamosa. Each of those five are worthy of species status in their own right. But only after we complete our studies. At this stage, I've done all the taxonomic stuff, but now we've got to hand it over to the Sharp Tool Boys, such as my colleague, Dr John Conran, where he will apply the science to it to prove beyond doubt that they are indeed species and are genetically opposite to each other. Then we have this strange tuberous drosera, which is heterophylla. And I've counted, on average, 11 to 13 petals per flower. The flower is large. It can be around about five centimetres in diameter. Again, this one closes up at night and opens again during the day. And each one of the stamens is ripe on every other day. So that today we have this one producing pollen, the next day this one takes over and so on and so forth. The end result being is there's just about every flower in the population is pollinated eventually. Hugelii. This one is an erect plant. It can grow up to about 45 centimetres tall, but when it does, it really needs to lean on some grasses, otherwise it will topple over. And its characteristics are its pendulous lamina and bell-like lamina. White flowers that open and close over a number of days until pollinated. One of the rosetted species, Drosera zone area. You will only find zone area in deep sands in southwest Western Australia. Those sands might be white silica sand like this shot here, but they can also be beige to yellow type sands. It is extremely common from Kalbarri in the north, almost out to the gold fields, which is inland from Perth, right to east of Esperance. Uh, I, in one of the talks of the forum one day, there was some lad on there saying it's probably one of the rarest tuberous drosseras in the world. Well, I'm sorry, it's the most common tuberous drosser in the world. It's everywhere. It rarely flowers. In all the time that I've been in the bush looking for these things and my colleagues, etc., we have I have personally never seen it in flower in the field. Phil Mann, a friend of mine, saw it once. I have seen it only in cultivation. And the way I get it to flower in cultivation is I lift X amount of tubers and I put them in a plastic bag and close it up. 
and the ethylene gas evidently from one tuber to the other stimulates the tubers to flower. And that's the only way I can get them to flower. But in the field, it doesn't really have to flower that much because it asexually reproduces like crazy. Uh, each plant from its mother tuber will come up and produce the rosette, and in a good season, some nice moisture around, it will physically produce one, two, three, about five extra additional tubers, daughter tubers. And because of this activity, it's not unusual to see square metre patches of zone area packed in in compact clusters. Who have we got here? Miriantha is a swamp loving tuberous drosera. And it's also a late one. This one flowers around Christmas. Our tuberous droseras, the first cabs off the rank, are the rosetted species. The first rains, moisture comes around about March. The rosetted species come out and do their thing, and one of the first things many of them do is flower. Then, once they've been pollinated, they get into the production of producing leaves. One species, Macrophylla, actually produces a rosette and then flowers. It's one of the weird ones. All the climbers and erect species have to grow and grow and grow, and then when they get to the end of their height, then they flower. So much so that Miriantha is late to come up in the swamps and is late to flower, and it's quite common to see these in flower in December. Here is a, another interesting habitat in southwest Western Australia. If you're flying into, west, into Perth from the eastern states, you will see salt lake after salt lake. And I mean salt lakes, there's salt crystals in those salt lakes. Nothing grows in the salt. But the shores of these salt lakes are just marginally higher than the actual average tide level or height level of the salt lakes. And when it rains, the water runs through the shorelines and takes the salt down into the lower pan. And consequently, the soils on these shores of these salt lakes, we've had them tested, are salt free. They're completely sweet for plants. And two species have made it their home. One, Drosera zigzagia, which is a yellow flowered species. And closer to the water, just down from the zigzagias, you'll get the Selena, Drosera Selena. This is zigzagia, known because the main axis zigzagged. And I couldn't use flexuosa because that had already been used. And we've got Selena over here. The interesting thing about Selena is it looks like a small Drosera peltata. It has a basal rosette, which comes up first. And then secondly, an innovation arises from the centre of this rosette. But this crazy little critter has decided to keep its rosette one or two sand grains lower than the surface of the soil. And I've scratched my head for many years thinking, why is it doing that? The interesting thing about it is, I should be able to explain it a little bit later on, is the, the sand grains are silica sand and are shipped to Japan for optical lens making and cameras, etc. Really, the rosettes are in a little glass house there's sufficient light coming down through the grains of sand to illuminate that area. And there's also sufficient passages and walkways, etc., for minute critters to be captured by the basal rosette lamina. And it takes one other, it does one other thing to facilitate the capture of little critters in the sand grains below soil. It actually rolls up its lamina into a tube. So the critters can walk through the sand grains or if they unluckily walk through the tube, they're doomed, they're done. And with the populations of Selena, they're always the closest to the salt water itself. And with investigation on site, we've actually found that the tuber's depth up here is, say, five centimetres. But as we get closer and closer to the salt, the tuber is virtually sitting just underneath the sand grains, trying to keep away from that salty, briny solution area. There we got there. Drosera browniana. This is a rosetted species. 
it physically grows in an area we call the gold fields. If you take a picture of Western Australia and go inland from the coast in an area running from the north to the south is what they call a greenstone belt. And this greenstone and other minerals harbours nickel, gold, zinc, you name it, we've got it. We're, Western Australia is extremely rich in minerals. This guy grows in decomposed greenstone. At one time when they were inselbergs, they were no doubt growing on, in the little fissures and holes and what have you in the, in the rock surface. But as the rock has eroded away over the arms, it's come down to as flat as the ground surrounding it. But every time you come across one of these decomposed granite outcrops flat to the ground, in this particular region, east of Hyden, right out in the dry country, you will find Drosera browniana. It also changes its flowering time to suit the conditions it received this year. And where this grows is hell to get to. It's tyre staking, it's nasty, there's no reception on your phone. It's really bad news if you get stuck out there. The other rotten part about it is, two years ago you saw it on the 9th of August flowering. You go out the following year on the 9th of August and there's nothing there. It decided to flower three weeks beforehand and then shut down. Or sometimes you go out there and it's September that it's doing it. So it's potluck to take someone out there to show them this, whether you're going to see it or not. Just to put you in the uh, picture here, um, this is the only one of my shots I've photoshopped. This is the habitat that it grows in. These little patches here is where, what they look like. They grow like crazy. There's a whole bunch of them there. I've taken shots from here and brought them forward just to show people the habitat and what they look like. And the interesting thing about this particular tuberous drosera is that the petals are pink on the outside and white on the inside. Really strange. Then we've got our yellow flowering species. We've got Intricata, Zigzagia, Subhotella, Sulfuria, and Morii. I've done a paper on these and split all these out into their various areas, but the only thing they have in common is yellow or lemony yellow flowers. Squamosa, Drosser erythroiza subspecies Squamosa. It has got an old name of Drosser Squamosa, and there's good evidence at this stage to go back to that old name and call it what it is, an individual species in its own right, but clearly in the erythroiza complex. There's my friend and botanical colleague, Denzel Murford, who lives in South Australia, and just to give you an idea, this is in his hometown of Encounter Bay in South Australia. Just in the sand dunes here, you will find three species all growing together within stone's throw of the ocean. With Tacarii, Planchanii, which belongs to the Macrantha complex. We have a paper rolling at the moment where we have four, I think it is, four macranthas that are being pulled out as individual species, but they all belong to the macrantha complex. One of the biggest problems we've got with complexes is trying to establish who is the type. We've got to go back to the old authors, we've got to go back to the old material. In some cases, there is no old material. Linley, for instance, named many of the species like Drosera gigantea in an appendix to the plants of the Swan River region in Western Australia. And he rattled on about particular plants. But there is no type specimen squashed anywhere. We have to work with his words. And his words, unfortunately, are very generalised. So what we've got to do then is go to the history 
and in my state, it only start, we only started colonisation in 1829. We know who was collecting plants at those times and sending them to various herbaria here in Europe, guys like my hero, James Drummond. We know his movements from his correspondence. So what we try to do is to tie up the history to where these guys were or where they could have been or where they couldn't get to to establish what plant they were actually talking about. Now, it's A-OK -okay with Drosera gigantea. That's pretty well finely cut. But when they say it's Drosera squamosa, is he talking about Magna, Kalina, Erythoriza, Erythoriza, Variety imbecilla? Which one is it? So we have to establish first, and from that we can work on the complex and pull them all apart and put them in their right little boxes. But it's quite difficulty, difficult in a lot of the complexes to get it right in the first place. And in that particular case, what I was leading to is we have Drosera planchonii, which is clearly a Macrantha complex plant, but it has sufficient characters, good characters, hard core characters, uh, that we can use, and it shows that it is indeed a good species in its own right. But yes, it's clearly related to the Macrantha complex. But the way I see these plants, they've found a way to physically... They found a design that works for them. So why change it? If it's not broken, don't change it. So through evolution, they've got to a stage where, hey, this is cool, I'll just sort of climb up here, lean on other guys for support. When I get up the top, I'll flower. Uh, I won't get wrecked because I've been supported by supporting little twigs and branches of little bushlets, etc. My pollinator is, believe it or not, a honey eater who also not only takes nectar but also takes little insects and they can jump and scamper all over the supporting bushes and lean over and get into the flowers but if they tried to get, do that to the actual main axis of the plant they'd wreck it in about two seconds so here's a plant clearly using other plants as perches for their po pollinator and it works for them Then we've got the tube of stylus complex. You can see the headaches that Alan has with all these plants. I know they're different. I put them into their categories of complexes and from there I try to figure out how are you different to you and where do you fit into the pattern. And this is clearly a good species but it's clearly related to the tube of stylus group. And all tuber stylus on the style stigma department have a bunch of appendages like trumpets, a trumpet mouth. And it's virtually one trumpet mouth clustered together, i.e. the name of the plant, tuber stylus, tuber trumper, trumpet. And we've got three in this complex to sort out. But this particular one... Most of the type for tuber stylus, which I named, has a rosette that gets no more than around about three and a half centimetres in diameter. It asexually reproduces and makes large clumps. This one tends to be an individual. It has rosettes that get up to around about the 10 centimetre in diameter size in old specimens. It's extremely floriferous where the type has one or two flowers per rosette. So it's really out there as a, being a, a fantastic plant to have in a collection. The perfume is to die for. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's got a future. Then we get into the Drosera stolonifera complex. And here we had the situation where von Hugel, an uh, Austrian person, came to Western Australia in 1833 and was into botany and botanised and took collections back to Europe where they were named by various people. And his Drosera stolonifera was actually collected near Perth in an area I've discovered which is now a golf course. So we could not get material from where he got it from. But we then had to pick up areas that hadn't been urbanised, find similar situation and find the species and then we knew that Hugel's Stolonifera was this one.
So now we've got the type, we're armed with the type, we can look at all these other stoloniferary things and go, right, this one doesn't fit. Before we called the subspecies Rupercola, I've got rid of all the subspecies, this is now Drosera Rupercola. But it clearly belongs to the stolonifera complex. This one's quite unique in so much as the lamina acts like a Venus flytrap. It doesn't snap onto its prey, but when it captures prey, it will slowly fold onto the prey and consume it. And when it's finished, it will slowly open up again for the next capture. There are colonies of this thing in the outer wheat belt, start of the gold fields areas, and some of the Rupercolas, they're mostly this green, but I have found bronze and reds and dark maroon. So cultivation-wise, there's some great stuff to have in a collection. But they're all Rupercola. Here we have the F. rogulata complex. Here we go again. This one doesn't fit rogulata. It's different, grows in different areas, has a different shape leaf, it shows a PTO, uh, it has no tuber stylus like style stigmas, it has like hair like style stigmas which puts it into the rogulata, rogulata complex. Again, we have two or three to sort out here. This one is in the Stolonifera department, it's Ramelosa. Very, very common, probably coming second after zone area for commonness, providing you go to the right habitats, but it does spread from Kelbarri in the north to well east of Cape Arid in the south. In the Macrantha complex, just to give you an idea of some of the things we're up against, or the, some of the things we're, we're playing with, typical Macrantha grows up nearby supporting herbs of support so the birds can come in and pollinate it. Any time a lamina touches a nearby support, the back of those glands will actually glue within hours onto that support. And if you try to pull them off the support, they'll snap their glands off. Whatever the, the glue is, it's super glue. It, it really does a good job. But the interesting thing is, if it gets six or seven or eight glands onto its support, the remaining glands will still capture prey and bring them into the middle and process them. And what I do in my collection is, as they're growing up, I put a little bamboo pole. I just get the, the, the leaves on these are in clusters of three. We have one long one and a pair of smaller ones. I just get the longer one and hook it onto the bamboo. And then that grows a three or four more, and then I get that and just touch the bamboo, and within hours it's stuck on the bamboo. So I have this bamboo pole with this plant growing up here with its main things stuck on it. Then it flowers up the top, and it's great. looks good. Otherwise, if you don't do that, you've got these things scrambling all over your collection. <laughs> it makes quite a mess. But interesting, just if you take the complex of Macrantha, you can see here just a few micrographs I've done of the seeds. This is Planchonii. This is a thing we're going to call Hirsuta. And this is um, Drosera eremea. But you can see just from the seed morphology alone, they are good characters. I've got it to the stage now with my studies over all the years, you can give me a seed of a West Australian plant and I'll tell you what species it is under the microscope from a seed. They are unique little characters, and there's no argument. And the great thing about it is, even if it's immature seed in your press specimen, that the immature speed seed is also displaying the same characteristics. Like this fellow here has a head like a carpet tack. There's the main seed, but it has this wing along the back. And the reason for the wing, it's like some of your... European trees that when the seeds are released it boomerangs or propellers to its next desti des destination. They're actually windborne seeds and you can let them go, they're great fun to see going up and down and what have you. So it can be really well dispersed. So evolution has changed these things from probably 
what they all were, one species, and they've speciated and done their thing. Erythrogyne, this is the one I was talking about earlier that takes the cake for the longest. Three metres is the longest I've measured. And it's one of those species that, providing the conditions are right, it'll keep on growing. It's very common in cephalotus swamps, which are mostly wet most of the time. They do have drought periods and bad years. Again, the tuber on this thing is probably four centimetres below the soil, and it's probably around about 12 mil in diameter. To have such a tiny little tuber and this giant plant trailing off it, I'm thinking, what are these tubers really all about? Well, I think all they are is a package that can go into dormancy and sit there doing nothing until the conditions are right again, and then they will get the plant to the surface. Then it's up to the plant to physically do its thing. And if it's a good season, blow the tuber up a little bit, maybe make another one. But that's what the tube is doing. And I could, what I couldn't figure out is how to get three metres out of a little tiny tuber like that. The tube is only the start. Once the plant's out of the ground, the conditions are right, it's on its own, it can build itself from there. I call this one erythrogyne. Simple reason is the ovary is red. Who we got here? Another one of the Stolonifera complex. This is an old name, actually named by a Russian. Uh, Perpurescens uh, from material collected by my hero, James Drummond. And James used to make his money back in those days for a shilling a sheet. That would be probably 12 cents in today's money. And James would get on his horses He'd have kangaroo dogs with him and his rifle. He'd take tea and flour and sugar. But the rest he got from the land on three-month expeditions through southwest Western Australia. He used the dogs to run down kangaroos and game, so they had plenty of meat. Sometimes he took an Aboriginal backpacker, uh, Aboriginal uh, tracker with him. But most of the time, they say he could be seen walking through the bush with his two horses, one of them was named Carbine, and his dogs and his Aboriginal tracker are bending down at every opportunity and collecting plants and sending them back to Europe. And that's what financed his expeditions in those days, at a shilling a sheet, which wasn't much. But it's because of him that the material got here to, it actually came to Kew first, and from Kew, Hooker gave it to Planchon and all these various other authors that we see today in the in the the works and all the various herbaria through Europe and this one got to a Russian guy and he named it. Up until about two years ago this was buried in synonymy. It didn't exist. Um, my uh, a colleague who's now retired, Neville Marchant, Dr Neville Marchant uh, and myself, we actually called it Drosera stolonifera subspecies compactor. But since that time, we've done additional work on it, and lo and behold, we have a good species. The next problem, of course, is uh, the chap that collected it uh, and wrote up about it, the interpretation of where it came from is wrong, and we didn't know exactly where it was. And we thought it was Mount Williang, and then it was Wylan Up, and all this sort of business. So it was a real hard job to track this one down, but we eventually got it. This is one of the problems we have in Australia, as we have all over the world, is that I live in a house. I've raised my family in my house. My house used to sit in natural bush. Uh, the builder cleared the land and put my house and my swimming pool and my greenhouse there so I can have a happy life. And unfortunately, with our population growth, urbanisation is taking over these bush tracks that I used to run through as a kid. And you can see from this shot from Google, you? 
can see urbanisation. And it's just, I'll go back next week and this part here will be chewed out. They're actually working on this one at the moment. So eventually, urbanisation will be just like everywhere else in the world. House after house after house after house. And of course, the species diversification of the flora and the fauna in these areas go under. We take their habitat away from them. So what can we do to conserve what we're into? We can turn around and say, well, let's keep this area up here free. We'll call that a national park or a reserve or a flora reserve or what have you. But unfortunately, if you find gold, nickel or coal or what have you or iron ore on it, it will become a mine. When a block of land, a fifth of a, an acre, in Western Australia currently is worth up to $500,000 Australian dollars, it will become urbanisation. The almighty buck will physically take over conservation. We have situations, a friend of mine who has been working on one of these blocks to try and keep it as a natural bush block, took five years of fighting the local council, trying to stop it. Just the other day, they got the word, it's going to be houses, you've lost. So you can't really play the political game. Those guys can play it better than you. So I've thought long and hard, what can we do as individuals for the things that we love? How can we ensure that they're there in our world? And I think the only thing we can do is physically grow the things in cultivation. And the great thing about plants is they're not like animals or dolphins where you get one baby or two babies at best a year. With plants we have the, the technology to take a piece of plant and turn it into zillions very quickly. We can grow from seed, we can grow from leaf cuttings, we can grow from root cuttings, we can physically give plants good conditions and they will asexually reproduce themselves. And then with your surplus sell it at the local church or school fate. Give it to your friends. A young person comes along here. Try this. Your local botanical gardens. Give them collections as well. And to make it as common as anything in cultivation. Because in many cases, these things are going to go under. And we have situations between farming and urbanisation in Western Australia where some of the new species I've got to name very soon, the only known locations are roadsides. A road, three or four metres of dirt, and then a paddock of wheat. And that's where they grow, on that little piece of vegetation. Unfortunately, our main roads people in Australia have decided, let's come back to the one, have decided that all roads, bush track or not, shall be cleared three metres either side. So you get a bulldozer out and you scream down the side of the highway, chewing up all the flora and fauna. But that's what they do. We can't do anything about it. This is in Cape York Peninsula. I actually ha have a permit to collect plant material for herbarium specimens and scientific use and for my own collection, etc. And when I reported in, uh, you know, they asked how the trip go, etc. I said, it went fantastic. And I said, the great thing about it is the main roads are bowling over three metres either side of the road. And in many cases, I could get the specimens I wanted for the herbarium material off the side of the road. I didn't have to go into the bush to get the specimen. Oh, he says, oh, you can't do that. You've made a big mistake. No, 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 no. You've broken the terms of your permit. I said, well, what do I do then? Well, you've got to drive 1,500k back to Brisbane, get a permit to say that you want to collect the ant plant on the side of the road at GPS reading so-and-so, so-and-so, and drive back again and collect it after they've given you a permit. Terrific. By the time you get back there, they've shoved it all in a big heap and put a match to it. So what do you do? Do you play by their rules, which are ridiculous, or do you use your common sense, like I did, to take the material that was going to die anyway. So I don't care, in some cases, if I break the law to the terms of their collecting permits, etc., because, quite frankly, it's stupid in many, many cases. 
but I use common sense all the time. Because of this, in Western Australia, we only have three to four metres in many cases between the farmer's gate, uh, fence and the side of the road. And they've decided in Western Australia to do the same thing, three metres everywhere. So we're down to, in many cases, nothing between the farmer's fence and the road to three metres and one metre of vegetation natural left and the weeds get in and of course it dies. And in one particular case at a place up near Mullawar, the guy up there was so zealous about keeping three metres away that trees that had an elbow-like branch sticking out like that, he cut off the elbow because it was at the three metre mark. But they've gone one step even better. They now have a machine which has a slasher that's horizontal and a slasher that's vertical, and it does three metres perfectly <laughs> and wrecks the bush down either side. But the interesting thing is, when a kangaroo jumps out of the bush, you can see it. You've got three metres, so you won't die. But consequently, when we go back to Google, and even before pre-Google, I knew it was bad out the back there and the farms and what was left, little patches of vegetation, etc. But when you throw Google on it and you look down on my part of the world, of southwest Western Australia, you can physically see the wheat belt. That is the wheat belt. All that. And it's been creamed with machinery. We grow wheat to feed the world. We make a lot of money out of our wheat and our sheep and our cattle, but to do that we had to kill the bush. This section here is the gold fields. This is where most of our mineralisation is in the south part of our state, where we've got nickel, gold, silver, copper, you name it, uh, uranium, we've got everything there. But the great thing about miners is you can go to a, a, a town 500k from my house, which is called Kalgoorlie, it's been going for 150 years. There's a whopping great big hole where they're digging out gold, but you can still walk out of town for about 10 or 15 minutes and be in natural bush. The beautiful thing about mining is that they do concentrate in an area. Unfortunately, with farming, they have to clear half a European country to make enough money to feed their family. So it's a really wasteful practice. But you can see here just how much has happened. And this is only since 1829. So we're turning this into Europe very, very quickly, but we've got better machinery. Just not a bad, a, a, an axe and a back. We've got D9 bulldozers and some really nasty stuff. So this is another case where I fret that my grandson will have nothing to botanise when he gets up to my stage, that it's all going to go. So what can we do? Well, quite frankly, there's nothing we can do. As far as legislation and so on and so forth. But as individuals, for our chosen plant, carnivorous plants, we can do something. Let's make them as common as muck everywhere. Of course, there are areas down the south which are national park. This is the Fitzgerald National Park. This will not be turned into wheat fields, but unfortunately we have another disease which is called Phytophthora, which came in from South Africa. And it's a soil-borne fungi that gets into the sapwood of the trees and starves it by taking its ability to take moisture from the ground. So it actually dies of thirst. And it's transmitted in the area from foot, vehicle, wheels, etc. And there's no known cure. Here you can see asexual reproduction on the Drosera radicans where it's sending down these tuberous making stolons. Here is a subspecies gen geniculata, Gigantia geniculata, where I've done something special to it. Now, I'm not going to tell you what I've done to it because that's my proprietary thing. But this is what you can do. If you find the magic formula, you can actually induce these things to produce 
stolons from the leaves, at the ends of which they'll produce tubers. And this is how you can asexually re reproduce things. So you figure it out yourself. <laughs> Took me a long time, but I can do this at will all day long. But just goes to show they've got the ability to asexually reproduce. Here's a Drosera aberrans, which was previously subspecies aberrans in the Wittacarii complex. And you can see here all the additional jorta producing stolons happening off the bottom of that plant. We got? This is zone area. Again, you can see the daughter producing tuber stolons off the side here. Another thing with tuberous drosser is if they're not happy at their depth, they will send down a dropper. We affectionately call them dropper roots, but they're a dropper stolen. And it'll go down to the depth it's happy with and produce its new tuber there. So much so that because I grow a lot of my collection in very short, shallow pots, uh, every three or four years I have to retrieve the tubers from the bottom of the pot and they're pancaked on the bottom. The spherical tuber has turned into a coin. But they're still OK. And that's me in my greenhouse. That's my tuberous drosser collection. We're a while away many, many, many hours. Sand grains. Just very quickly, a lot of the European people were having trouble with tuberous drosser growing. The, the tubers were not making it to the surface of the pot. On investigation, we found that the sand grains they were using were sharp sand. The sand that's in Western Australia, this is a silica sand sample, is almost like a water-washed rock. It's rounded on its edges. And it can be likened to a bucket of ball bearings. You can jump up on it all day long and it will never compact. There will always be airways around the ball bearings. With the rounded edges to the silica sand, the same thing. You can punch it down with a compactor all day long, but it'll always have X amount of airways around it. With the sharp sand, the sharp sand locks together like a jigsaw puzzle and produces almost granite-like soil structures. And the tuberous strossers are not tough in punching through that, gran that, that concrete arrangement. So the secret is, is to try and find sand grains with a rounded edge to them, and then you'll have no trouble in growing tuberous drosseras su successfully. Although in one particular case just recently, uh, one of the lads uh, planted a uh, drossera hugulii uh, tuber uh, in sand grains that looked a little bit on the sharp side, uh, but he's wound up with five tubers out of the exercise. So the, the scratching of the uh, stolen coming up has been activated into producing more, more uh, tubers. Then very quickly we'll get into the... Uh, how are we going for time here, Marcel? Um, just Nearly there? Okay, we're into there. The top of Australia is tropical. It has two seasons, basically. A monsoon, where it's wet as hell, you row a boat everywhere, you can't get across the country. In the Kimberley, we can't travel through it unless we've got a helicopter. It's boggy everywhere, the, all the creeks are running, they're deep. We have to wait till the dry season. So we have a wet season and a dry season. This is where we have the perennial tropical drosseras. Now this one here, it, the type for Pedialaris actually comes from Cooktown, where Captain Cook, the English guy, got a hole in, the, in his ship and careened it at, at Endeavour River and fixed it there, but um, Sir Joseph Banks did botanising there and he collected this, took it back to Kew. It was named many years later as Drosera pedialaris. I was lucky enough to have the original specimens collected by Cook in 1770, sent to my herbarium in Western Australia where I actually studied it in depth. It's a really exciting thing to see a piece of history in front of you under the microscope, you know, real thrill. But what it did tell me was, this is the type for pedialaris. Everything else we're seeing is not Pedialaris. It's a tropical drosser in the same gang as Pedialaris, but they're all different. That's not Pedialaris. But about 20 years ago, some of the botanists were saying, no, that's Pedialaris. Falcon or I. Who we got now? Aflinata. 
the true Lenata grows in the Atherton Tableland on the East Coast. This one in the Northern Territory has hairs on it like Lenata, but it's not Lenata. It's an undescribed species. Who we got next here? Aphpedialaris. This is the thing from Northern Territory that we've been calling Pedialaris, but when you put it up against the type, it's nothing like the type. Then we have a paradoxa complex. I named a drosser a paradoxa, which is like a shish kebab stick with a few leaves on it and a flower spike at the top. But we also have a swamp form and an orange flowered form. So we have two more paradoxes in that little complex. There we go. Another aphpedialaris from the Northern Territory, but you can get green ones and maroon red ones. From one population of Falconeri, or Falconeri, whichever way you want to say it, uh, from one population to the next, they are slightly different, but no, they're, they're all Falconerized. They all fit into that character set. But as far as cultivation is concerned, it's good to have one from there and one from there and one from there. But as far as botanically speaking is concerned, they're all Falconerized. This one, I don't know what's going on. I think it's a new species. I'm thinking at one moment, hello, it's a hybrid between uh, Canelii, which grow, and maybe Darwinensis, which grows over there, but I can't find the two parents. And here's this thing growing at this stage under 100 mil of water. And if you look real carefully, you can see tadpoles swimming past. And it remains under water for around about a month and a half. No ill effects. Then the waters recede, it recedes and it goes down to a bulb-like base like a Venus flytrap arrangement. It's not a bulb, it's just the thickened part. And the ground comes like concrete and then the next wet season it does it all again. So we're chasing this one at the moment. You know, are you a hybrid? Are you a good species? We don't know. It's very interesting all the same. This is one of the problems of working in the Northern Territory, Kimberley, anywhere in the north of Australia, anywhere where there's water, you will get these things called sand flies and they are microscopic, you cannot see them with the eye. But they slit you, they do some nasty stuff with their saliva, you blow up into a mosquito sized lump and the itch, all you want to do is take your knife and cut the lump off. It sends you around the bend, you go crazy. And they are really, really bad. So if you're ever going to those parts of the world, stick the long pants on. Don't walk around like goose here with shorts on, because that's what happens. Four days of misery. Darwinensis. Another giant plant of Falconeri. That one there is around about 12 centimetres in diameter. The interesting thing about Falconeri, they're deciduous. They drop all the leaves and they go back to that bulb-like arrangement. And then the ground dries out to the point where it's concrete. Again, you could get your rock hammer, hit the, the ground and sparks would fly. Dilatato pedialaris by Dr Kondo, Professor Kondo named that one. What have we got here? Dilatado pedialaris. These are the tracks. In the Kimberley, there's no roads. We've got one main road, the Gibb River Road. We've got the road to the Columbaroo. We've got a few tracks going to the Mitchell Plateau and what have you. But most of the time, they're lines of least resistance. They're not roads. They're not tracks. They're just lines of least resistance. So we punch our way through there. And when we go out, I like to go out with a group who are interested in other things. So we've got at least two vehicles all the time because there's no breakdown roadside assistance out there. Uh, this is a Grevillea teretifolia, um, the Aboriginals, this, this was their lolly. The nectar on this is heaven. You think honey's nice, this is better than honey. I'm having a little bit of a feed. In the winter, in the wet season, the water's up to here. This is why you can't get around the Kimberley. Just all these simple streams at this stage in the dry turn into raging rivers and you can't cross. Typical camp in the Kimberley. It's a little bit rough, but
but we have medicine to take care of that. It generally goes like that. <laughs> this is a very good colleague of mine, Gordon Graham, is probably one of the best camp cooks in the world. He can knock up cordon bleu like you wouldn't believe. In the Broome area, the Drossera Broomensis, that's the sort of territory it grows in, that's a giant termite mound. In the Kununurra area, this is on the road out to Argyle, you can take a typical habitat like this area here where it gets a little bit more moisture and you will get these species all growing in that paddock. You'll get a Biblis, you'll get a, a, um, an Ordensis and you'll get a, uh, what have we got up there, an Indica. Drosera banksii, Ordensis, and the flower colours can be anywhere from white to every shade of pink. Ordensis again, even in the lamina department, they can be lemon laminas, orange lamina, red lamina. Subtilis, this is one of the weirdos, it's an annual, has four petals on it like the Drosera pygmaea and is only around in the wet season and when you go in the dry season it's finished and gone. So the only time I was seeing this is helicopter expeditions early in the year, in January and February. Brevi Cornus, give you an idea, just some of the diversity in the flowers. This one here is rather cute, it's got a white hyaline around each petal. Drosser indica complex. Yes, we have a bunch of species in this complex. Uh, Jan has already pulled one of these from the complex and named it after Ziggy. It's, it's a distinctive thing. It's a, it has, as most of these have, in the axles of the leaves here, they have these strange non-glandular appendages. Now, I don't know what they're for. My colleagues don't know what they're for, but we will eventually find out what they're for. But in the case of heart myorum, we have a mulberry on a stick, a yellow mulberry on a stick. But we've also identified the letter Y. We've also identified bull's horns. We've also identified an Englishman's bowler hat on a stick. We've also identified the letter S placed horizontally on a stick, so it's like a branding iron. If you heated it up and went on a cow, it would be an S, a yellow S. Right down to a simple conical figure. There's probably more, but they're the ones we've beamed in on. We go to a field and we see three or four different indicas in the one paddock. You look and you look and you look at everyone in the Kimberley and they're not breeding with each other, which is suggesting they're genetically isolated from each other. So there's no argument there. What I can see is these guys have figured out that by producing a plant like this, it's just perfect, works a treat. But they've speciated away from each other and they've done some crazy things in their flowers like blood red cobra stamens, we've got uh, giant cerise petaled arrangements with deltoid red stamens. So we've actually got a bunch of different indicas which we know are all different to each other. But we have one giant problem. There's no argument that we're dealing with species, none whatsoever. Jan, you are correct. The problem is we have 19 names in synonymy. And if you take heart my arm and throw it into the patch, we've got 20 names. How do we find out what is the type, number one? We're getting closer to knowing that because it's India and what have you. But when we come down to Australia, these things have gone crazy. They've come down the east coast where they're basically the same thing, but as soon as they hit the Northern Territory and went westwards to the, to, uh, the Kimberley, they've gone bananas and speciated all over the place. What we don't know is the old names, like, for instance, Drossera serpens, which was collected in the Northern Territory. Which one of these is serpents? That's the problem. 
So naming something at the moment is a little bit dangerous until we can apply the previous names to what we know. So that's where we're at at the moment. I think, but I only think, Hartmeyer is probably out there, no problems whatsoever. The next hurdle is, next big one, who is Serpens? Because that was collected in the first colony in the Northern Territory. And I know for a fact that the white one is there, the cerise one is there, the normal pink and white one is there, the large pink flowered one is there, and I know there's red plant ones there, but it could be the orange flowered red or it could be the pink heart myororum. So we don't know. But it may all come out nice in the end, but that's where we're at with the Indica complex. We, we're, we've come a long way along the line. We know where we're heading. We're trying to get there. We're trying to sort this lot out and uh, hopefully it'll all be resolved. And we'll have no problems whatsoever, we can move on to the next problem. Next complex. Fertiliser, we all know when we first got our first plant, don't fertilise it, we'll kill the plant. Well, these are marsupial turds, or scats scientifically, manure from kangaroos. And you can see it's a collage of photographs there, a little pygmy drosser alongside of a giant marsupial waste. Yes, they eat foliage that is low in nutrients and what have you, and this probably works very well, but uh, it does suggest that they can take a little bit of fertiliser, which we know, providing we do it one-tenth recommended strength and not too often. Maybe there's a market in kangaroo poo. Pygmy Drosseras, Drossera salina, a natural hybrid between Occidentalis subspecies Australis and Drossera natigula. Uh, this has not been released anywhere in the world at this stage. So once it's named, I'll release it. Hyperostigma, one of the orange with the black centre species. My friend Denzel on the top of Bluff Knoll, I actually climbed up the thing, it nearly killed me. And up the top there, of course, there's Stylidiums growing with one of the Stylonifera complex, Drossera monticola. There's the boy, puffed. Echinoblastus, another pygmy Drossera. Platystigma. A typical Cape Arid habitat where you'll get these four species growing in the same area. These things, just quickly, uh, once the flower is pollinated, the ovules turn into seeds, they mature, and in most plants the ovary opens up and releases the seed. In the case of pygmy drosseras, they use the old sepals and the old petals and tend to glue it together at the top. The ovary bursts within and releases the seeds but holds it in a cage where the resting stipule bud of the pygmy drossera on bone, on bone dry but super hot soil is okay, but it holds its seed aloft with a gentle breeze going through it until the first rains where it decomposes and then it spreads its seed. So it's a way of keeping the seed off the hot soil. And we're calling it a sensor, just like the thing you see in church where they have incense on a little cage on a chain. With some more sensors. Some more mini arters. There's three mini arters, by the way. Occidentalis, one of the smaller ones. Pedialaris, which I named a few years ago. One of the Aphminiatas and its habitat. Drossera natigula. Drossera eniaba. And Aphcalistos. Pygmaea from Tasmania with the four petals on the flower. And we're back to the beginning. So there was about 15 photographs I actually had to take out of it to reduce the load on this little tiny computer here that belongs to him. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I, I'll give you a disc uh, later in the week where it's got all the photographs on it so you can get them home on your own computers and pull them apart 
and you'll see more. But about 15 have been taken from that. That's all I have for the presentation, so if you've got any questions you'd like me to answer for you. it's underwater, don't you? No, no. No, it's underwater for a month and a half. It just sits there. It doesn't rot. That's the interesting thing. It doesn't rot. But I've also got pygmy drossers that do the same thing. If it's an exceptionally wet year, I've got a drosser of Pulcella living underwater, about yay depth, for the same thing for about a month and a half. I actually showed Ziggy the spot where these things grow and where the water level comes up to. And no ill effects to the face whatsoever. You try that in cultivation, of course, and you come out a week later and it's a rotten mess. Yeah. <laughs> but in the field, no problems. Is the, wa the water standing still, though? It's not like a flowing water? No, it's standing still. It's just a, like a, a, you know, it's a big film of water over the top of it with tadpoles roaring past uh, for about a month and a half, then it slowly recedes. But when it recedes, it goes back to bone dry, hard, compact soil. Sort of. How long is it out of the water before it... Well, really interesting, hard. it's in the same vein as the Vulcanorae and Canelii, as they're one of the first plants off the rain. In the wet season, we have the build-up in November, we have the true rains coming about Christmas time, January, February, and then they start easing off heading towards the dry of April, May. Those three species, including this beast you hear from Andorra, the first thing they do from dormancy is send up a flower spike, no leaves, or if there are leaves, little tiny insignificant leaves. They flower, get pollinated, make seed. Next trick is, let's make a rosette. And as they're building a rosette, this uh, inflorescence is slowly getting pushed over and turning to mush, and the seeds are, are washed away. So it's actually kicking off its life style or its life cycle in early November. It's also one of the earliest to take a dive to up the other end of the year, at the end of the wet. So it would actually be above the water to start and then it gets flooded, Correct. and then it dries up again. What, what, what it's doing is flowering in just moist ground, no worries, doing its thing, pollinated, everyone's happy. Now we'll start growing some leaves, so I'll catch a few bugs here and there. The big rains come, hello, I'm now underwater. I'll just sit here for a month and a half. The waters will recede in a month and a half. I'll catch some more bugs for a month, two months, three months, whatever and then I'll take a dive back to my children's places. Fascinating. And I'll go to sleep again. Bye bye. So yeah, it is, it's fascinating. <coughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the problems to, to match uh, the, the Syndica complex plants to the old uh, descriptions and, and to, to the names that are always uh, called synonyms. Have all these uh, old prototypes been lost or didn't get this? In some cases, we've got them. We've got them scattered to the four corners of the earth at the moment. We have a we have a team. We have Andreas, we have John Connor, and my colleague myself. We have another the young botanist, uh, Russell Barrett, who has been combing through all the herbaria, including here, for all the indica things. And we're, from that, we've got enough evidence now to probably figure out what's going on. But the problem is, is trying to find that those characters that we need to find, i.e. the non-glandular appendages. If we can find those on, on a specimen somewhere, we say yes to that. But the problem is that uh, Von Mueller, who was the resident botanist in Victoria, his descriptions were pretty lean. Green, sticky, plant with white flowers, stock, next species. <laughs> Port, Port Essington. Mr. Armstrong, 1839. So then you've got to go and dig in the history of Mr. Armstrong. When was he there? About what time do you been there? What is it, old Port Essington? You can't get there. You've got to fly, you know? So with the history, with the descriptions, with type material that's crap most of the time, it's difficult. But we're getting there. And if I may add something, Several of these species are very old, very old uh, species. There was no demand for a physical present type. So it was only a description accompanied by a drawing, or maybe not even a drawing. 
And this is the problem. Sometimes there are no types existing. And then it's, it's necessary to find uh, where this plant was occurring, all the work that was doing the Chisholm plant, for example. He's called it Drosseridica. There is no type. There's, there is no material that we can gather, but we maybe can, we've got material that is like the type because it came from India. Simple as that. So what grows in India? And we're hoping it's going to be a little short thing that we think it is, that yellow bead with white or pink flowers, quite boring. And it's also down in Australia. It actually is the species that grows closest to, to my, where I live, in the gold fields. But when you get up into the Kimberley and the Northern Territory, you've got all these crazy ones. And that's where Mueller uh, actually went on expeditions. He went on a few through there and collected these things. And in many cases, we can't find the bits and pieces, but we'll sort it out eventually. But we know there's species there. We know they're different. We've got to figure out all the synonymy, all those names, and take it from there. Now, luck would have it that if we've got a varietal name, we can throw that in the bin, because variety names don't mean anything. You can actually turn a, a, a variety into a species, and if it's called Jack, you can call it Jill. You can throw Jack in the bin. That's how much importance a variety has got. So the saving grace on many of these things might be because they've got a name, variety. That might be the saving grace for many of the species. We've got 19 names and synonymy. Uh, the worst one we've got is serpents. It's been recorded as a species, so it's a genuine species. What we don't know is who's serpents, which one of all these guys is serpents. That's the first problem that's all out. Then we've got a situation where we've got uh, angustifolia and a variety of same from the Lakes District in Victoria. We might be able to sort that out. So, who is Angustifolia? That name. Who does he belong to? So, once we work out these names, then the ones left over will need a name. But up until that stage, it's a, a bit of a gamble. But I think it's worthwhile doing. <coughs> but it's not easy to do, and it can't be solved in five minutes. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much, people. Thank you very much, Alan.